Hello. I'm a little bit further in my project to make my own DCC decoders from scratch. I had expected to have a prototype that fits inside my N-Gage Super Voyager and controls its lights in response to DCC commands, but haven't quite managed to get that far yet. By the end of the fourth video in this series, I'd learnt everything necessary to make a decoder that could control the lights and found an arrangement of components that would be compact enough. There was only really one element left to tackle, which was to make the decoder pins attach firmly to the board. When experimenting, I just soldered some ribbon cable to pins, but the pins are a very tight fit into the decoder socket, and the plastic moulding around the pins started to slide on them, so I had to push the pins in and pull them out by holding the wires, which is bound to break them eventually. The pitch of the holes in the perf board I'm using is 2.54mm, whereas the decoder pins are 1.27mm pitch. I experimented with bending one end of the pins and it looked like they'd be just about able to reach the four perf board holes without connecting any two of them together. To get power and read the DCC signal requires the two middle pins of the decoder socket, and the white and red lights are pins 5 and 6, so I needed to attach the pins offset from the centre of the perf board for the whole thing to fit within the Voyager's body. Once I'd soldered the pins to the bottom of the board, they were firmly connected, which made it much easier to connect and disconnect the board from the socket. I did some continuity checks to make sure they were all soldered on properly, and that none of them were electrically connected to their neighbours. Having done several videos now about this project, I think it's worth doing a recap of how all the bits work. DCC sends information to decoders by flipping the track voltage. At any one time, one track will be at the DCC high voltage, and the other track will be at the DCC low voltage. How long the voltages stay one way around represents a DCC 1 or a DCC 0. The voltages can flip almost 20,000 times per second. There is theoretically always full power to the track, and the direction of current will be flipping back and forth along with the voltages. In a locomotive's 6-pin decoder socket, pins 3 and 4 are connected to the tracks. So these are used for power to the decoder, and for the decoder to detect the 1s and zeros of the DCC signal. Pins 1 and 2 connect to the motor, but I'm not tackling motor control yet, so I'm ignoring those. Pins 5 and 6 connect to the negative ends of the front and rear lights, or just white and red lights in the case of the Voyagers I'm using for this project. For the main brain of my decoder, I'm using an 80 tiny 85 microcontroller, which after some initial setup hurdles I now find very easy to program. Eventually I may choose to use something more modern instead, but I'm sticking to it for now. To run at 16 MHz, the AT Tiny needs 5 volts DC for power, so the DCC track power needs to be converted. The first step is a full bridge rectifier. That converts the power from its inputs, whichever way around they are, to a fixed positive and negative at its outputs. This turns the alternating DCC track voltages into a fixed DC voltage, with a bit of a voltage drop. My DCC system outputs 13 volts, which comes out of the rectifier as about 12 volts DC. To reliably reduce that to 5 volts, I use a voltage regulator. The voltage regulator needs a capacitor before its input and also after its output in order to produce a steady 5 volt output, which is used to power the AT Tiny. To detect the flipping of the DCC voltages, one of the eighty tinys input pins is directly connected to one of the tracks. The 13 volts of the high track power would be far too high for the eighty tiny, so a diode and 10k resistor protect it. When the track voltage goes to DCC low, it will pull the eighty tinys input pin to low, and when that track's voltage goes to DCC high, the diode will prevent any current flow, and the eighty tiny will pull that input pin to the eighty tiny's high level of 5 volts. This works because the AT Tiny is also being powered from the track power, so the low voltage level is consistent between the track and the AT Tiny. Since pins 3 and 4 of a decoder socket connect directly to track, the AT Tiny's input pin can be connected to either of those. In the layout I came up with, it was easiest to connect to pin 4. To activate locomotive lights, a 6 pin decoder needs to connect the relevant pin back to the track to complete the circuit for the lights. The DAPOL Super Voyager rectifies positive track power and connects it to a common positive that the red and white lights use. So at any time, whichever rail is at the DCC high voltage will be connected to the positive of the lights. To ensure a constant power to the lights, the decoder therefore needs to connect their negative back to whichever rail is at the DCC low voltage, 
which will be the negative pin of the decoder's full bridge rectifier. The decoder also needs to add extra resistance into the circuit because DCC track power is higher than DC. In my previous video I worked out that 1K would be right for each of the white and red lights in the Voyager. To stop all the lights being permanently on, the decoder uses bipolar junction NPN transistors to make or break the light circuit. The pin from the light's negative comes into the transistor collector via the extra resistor, and the AT Tiny controls the base of the transistor via a 6.8K resistor. The emitter is connected to the negative of the decoder's full bridge rectifier. So, when the AT Tiny wants the lights to come on, it sends its relevant output pin to the high logic level, which turns the transistor from fully off to fully on, which completes the circuit for the light. I've been advised to use MOSFET transistors instead of these ones, and I will do that and have actually now got some, but I was keen to get a working decoder built, so for this prototype proceeded with the bipolar junction NPN transistors, because I already had everything calculated and planned for using them. Some elements of assembly were fiddly, but on the whole I found the surface mount components and the perf board really easy to solder to, and I even stopped using flux. I have my soldering iron at 340 degrees Celsius, I keep it clean using a brass wire sponge, and I suspect the solder I'm using contains lead. Several elements needed to have crossed wires, so for those I used insulated single core ultrafine wire. Wire strippers don't work on these. So to start with, I tried using the heat of the solder to connect them, but the join was really weak. A gentle slice with a craft knife and then basically scraping the end off worked far better. My soldering iron came with a little dust cover for its tip, which I've been careful with for many months, but the inevitable happened. One time I forgot the cover was still on and switched the iron on, so I don't have that anymore. As I added components to the board, I tested their connections for continuity using my multimeter both to make sure they were connected where intended, and to ensure no accidental connections where there shouldn't be any. Once everything was assembled, I started making a basic DCC decoder tester, because at every step of this project things haven't worked as expected and have needed investigation. Having a simple tester would make it easier to do fault detection, and would also protect my trains from basic decoder faults. Its features were built up in iterations, and I recycled an experiment board for it. The blue terminal connectors and the transistor on it aren't connected to anything. The first iteration just delivered power to the relevant pins. I wanted to confirm the right voltages were in place before plugging in an AT Tiny 85. The input was 12 volts DC and was correctly dropped to 5 volts for the AT Tiny, so it was safe to plug one in. On first test in a Voyager, it didn't work as expected. Voltages seemed to be correct, and if I directly connected the 80 tiny pins that control lights to the 5 volt power, the lights came on. Or at least the red one did. The white lights used to work too on this Voyager unit, but they don't anymore. I confirmed that by putting the blanking plate back in and connecting the locomotive to DC power. Eventually I realised I'd forgotten to put electrical insulating tape on the bottom of the decoder, so it's entirely possible the white LED circuit got directly connected back to track power without the necessary extra resistance, and the LED got fried. That made two driving car units with one non-functional light colour. Since the behaviour of the decoder was so far from correct, I enhanced the tester to include LEDs. It mimics what I found in my Voyager models. Power goes directly to two pins, diodes rectify positive power to both LEDs, and the negative of the LEDs connect to the other two pins, for the decoder to connect them back to negative power. I also temporarily changed the programming on the AT Tiny 85, such that it would blink one LED twice, then the other LED twice, then pause for a bit, then repeat. When I powered the decoder tester with DC, it worked. When I connected it to DCC track power, it stopped working. This was very confusing. I confirmed the power was being rectified correctly by connecting a battery both ways around. At this point I started to suspect the bridge rectifier. When I first started this project to make a decoder I couldn't find any other YouTube videos of people doing the same thing and giving the same level of detail, but now a leopard's tail is also making his own DCC decoder to control lights using an AT Tiny 85. He's got far more electronics knowledge than I have, so his videos are proving very interesting and useful for me. I'm sure I saw a comment in one of them saying a normal bridge rectifier shouldn't be used to convert the DCC power because they're not designed for such high frequencies. 
I looked at the datasheet for my rectifiers, and it says they're 60 Hz. Looking at an AC mains adapter, it says it expects 50 Hz. So the rectifier would be fine for use with a normal AC frequency, but the DCC signal could change at up to nearly 20,000 Hz, since the minimum valid duration of half a DCC 1 bit is 52 microseconds. I had just enough surface mount Schottky diodes available to make a power rectifier out of those. They have a recovery time in the order of nanoseconds, so should easily keep pace with the DCC signal. I hadn't designed the layout of the board with these in mind, so it was fiddly to squeeze them on and connect them, and the end result is a right mess. I tested them with my multimeter before connecting any power to make sure there wouldn't be a short circuit, and found one of the diodes was the wrong way around. Once they were the correct way around, I had the AT Tiny working correctly on DC power again, whichever way the power was connected. But again, not correct when connected to DCC power. Cue more head scratching and theorising. I began to wonder if the AT Tiny was stopping and starting a lot. The first thing it does is illuminate the red LED, so it might be getting that far, stopping, and then starting and illuminating it briefly and repeating. The result would be a dim looking LED. This had been happening several stages ago in this project because I didn't have capacitors either side of the voltage regulator, so I wondered if the first capacitor needed more capacitance. I tried attaching a much larger one in parallel, but it didn't seem to help, which was odd. Eventually, I did more continuity testing and found the capacitors had actually become disconnected from the voltage regulator's ground pin. I tested them after first connecting them, but the connection must either have been weak or the heat from connecting other components later on had remelted the solder and allowed the connection to break. The voltage regulator has two ground pins, so I connected the capacitors to the other pin, and after that the decoder behaved correctly on either DC or DCC power. I suspect that disconnected capacitors were the only cause of the problems. The prototype decoder from my previous attempt worked with the voltage regulator, but I think it would be best to stick with the diode arrangement in future iterations anyway. With power to the decoder now sorted, I put the original code back onto the ATtiny85 to process DCC signals. That totally failed when I first tried it. It didn't respond to instructions. My first approach to diagnosing this was to reprogram the ATtiny again, this time to illuminate an LED every time it detected a voltage change on its interrupt pin. That should have resulted in the LED being on apparently constantly, but it wasn't, so the pin wasn't detecting voltage changes. After various investigations I found the connection between the resistor and diode was broken. It looked connected, and even several continuity tests had passed, but those only worked because the multimeter's probe was touching the wire from the resistor rather than the pin of the diode. The fix was simply a bit more solder in the right place. After that, and reprogramming the ATtiny back to normal, it sort of started to work. It will respond to the first instruction to do something with the LEDs, but then it won't do anything more. I did actually have this problem with the previous prototype, but it went away. Now it's back, and is much more persistent. Of course, I've done various things to analyse this logically, but I haven't found the problem yet. When the DCC system is started, it's not sending any commands for address 221 which is the address I've given this decoder, so the decoder doesn't do anything. I've varied the delay between system or decoder startup and entering a command for loco221. When a speed and direction command is issued for address 221, the decoder responds to it, correctly. I can disconnect the decoder, change the direction of train 221, and then reconnect the decoder and see it respond correctly. There are a few things that can be deduced from this. The decoder must be correctly analysing thousands of DCC commands. It's having to discard the ones that aren't for address 221, and when one for address 221 eventually comes along, it has to recognise the address correctly, and then to activate the correct LED, it has to handle the direction part of the speed and direction command correctly. So that means the only difference in behaviour is the branch of code which executes when a speed and direction command is issued. But that's an extremely limited area of code. It's literally just setting the LED values via the Arduino digital write function. I can't see any kind of state information that would prevent it from getting back to this branch of code having been into it at least once. I ran the decoder alongside the motorised vehicle from the Voyager to be sure the DCC system was actually sending the commands. On one occasion my decoder did respond to a change of direction without being powered off and back on, but this was a very isolated occurrence. 
I've done a variety of other experiments, including setting the values for the LED outputs directly rather than using the digital write function. The pattern I found is that the code does continuously, correctly, handle DCC change of direction commands, so long as neither of the LEDs are on while it's waiting for an instruction. If I set the LEDs to just blink when a direction command is detected for this decoder, it works. By the way, I changed the decoder's address to 4 while experimenting purely because it's quicker to enter on the controller. If I set either of the LEDs to stay on after the decoder's startup routine, then it won't respond to any direction commands. I took this further and disabled anything to do with DCC signal processing, and just set the LEDs to blink if the external interrupt is triggered, and it doesn't behave as expected if either of the LEDs are left on. In fact, I could barely get any kind of LED blinking working correctly with the interrupt service routine, which seemed downright odd. I double-checked the expected behaviour for interrupt handling in the ATtiny datasheet. I didn't find anything that contradicted what I already thought. I decided to remove the transistors and test board LEDs from the equation, which I did by taking jumper wires from the socket for the ATtiny to a breadboard, where I added some LEDs to be directly powered by the ATtiny. I then put the original code back onto the ATtiny, and it behaved correctly like this, responding to DCC direction commands and powering the LEDs as appropriate. In this scenario, the decoder board is rectifying and reducing track power to power the ATtiny, and the interrupt pin is connected via the board to one of the rails, allowing the ATtiny to monitor the DCC signal. My decoder board can control lights via its transistors, and it can correctly detect and decode the DCC signal but it seems something about an LED or transistor being on interferes with DCC signal monitoring. This is as far as I've got for now. This prototype of the decoder was supposed to just be about squeezing all of the components onto one board that would fit inside a Voyager, but it's turned out to be more about problem solving, and along the way I've managed to break the lights in at least two more Voyager driving cars. Nevertheless, it's still progress of some sort, and I've been quite pleased with being able to build the physical board at least. For now, I'm out of ideas for things I can check, so I might just move on to using MOSFET transistors to control the lights and see how that goes. That's all for now. Bye bye!